So what do we know about craters? Um, first of all, crater, I just have to disambiguate the word, right? Because we're familiar with, for example, Crater Lake or Diamond Head Crater here in um, on Oahu. Um, but a crater is not generally a volcanic crater. So we call these craters because they have the same shape as an impact crater. But strictly speaking, they're not a crater. They are a caldera, a mountain caldera. So you can have a, a volcano whose um, peak collapses, and that's called a caldera properly, even though we often call them craters. All right. So what is an actual crater? Um, an impact crater tends to have a you know, somewhat similar shape to a caldera, where it has sort of these peaks at the edges of the um, crater rim. And it tends to have a fairly flat surface um, compared to many caldera. And then also there is often a central peak. So we've got a, a crater floor, they've got some walls, and this highest point is called the rim. And then this is called the central peak. All right, so just to, you know, an example of an impact crater would be this, the Tycho crater on the moon. And here you can very clearly see its central peak is kind of looks like a mountain. Right? And craters on the moon come in all different sizes. So the ones that we can see most clearly are obviously the large ones. So here's the Copernicus crater, which is 90 kilometers in diameter. You can see here it's got several central peaks. Um, but there are also very tiny craters. So this is a kind of a, like a glass microsphere that was gathered um, by one of the Apollo missions. So it's an actual sample of lunar soil. And you can see here there's little micro craters on this. This entire sphere is about a quarter of a millimeter in diameter. So these are extremely tiny craters. They're still caused by the same you know, overall um, phenomenon and the impacts have the same exact physics. And so they often end up with similar shapes. So here, you know, the, the microsphere is more stiff than the collection of loose material that the, um, the lunar soil is mostly made of, but it still winds up having a distinguishable rim and even a, it's kind of hard to tell in this particular image, a little central peak. Okay, there's other um, images like this that you can find online. I find them fascinating. Uh, these are called micrometeoroid impacts. So whereas this Copernicus crater would be formed by a regular meteoroid, um, you know, bits of asteroid or comet, a micrometeoroid is one that has such a small size that it only leaves behind a very small crater. Um, and so you get different crater shapes based on the initial speed and you get different crater sizes based on that initial size as well. All right, so again, here's the Copernicus crater with all of our features and the, a couple more that I wanna point out beyond the floor, the wall, the rims and the central peak are what's called ejecta. So in the video that you just saw, you could see that the material would sort of sprays out of the impact zone and leaves a blanket uh, around the exterior of the crater. And this is what we call the ejecta blanket. And in general, these ejecta um, are, they're just pieces of whatever was on the surface and pieces of the impactor that get pulverized. Um, those can spray out and the large ones can form secondary craters. So some of these craters um, could be from possibly many of these small craters here um, from the ejecta. Uh, some of those craters are probably from, like this one has a central peak, so it's probably its very own impact. Um, another feature that we see are called rays. So there are these kind of uh, light streaks that you see surrounding these craters. And the Copernicus and Tycho craters have the most prominent rays. And those are just lines of material that from the ejecta that have fallen um, in kind of a ray-like pattern. And the origin of these rays was actually not fully understood for quite some time, because when you do experiments like the one you just saw in the video, where you drop um, solid objects into sand, you don't get rays. And so it wasn't until recently that a group of high school students was actually able to reproduce the rays 
the array structure that you see um, by using different um, roughnesses in the sand. So if you have you know, an irregular pattern of sand, you get the rays. If it's just smooth, you don't get them. So I found that really surprising. Okay, so here again are our lunar peaks and the, the, these are not mountains in the same way as Earth. So um, the process of mountain formation on Earth is driven by plate tectonics, uh, but the moon has no tectonic plates. It has no plate tectonic activity. And so these mountains are not formed by the same type of subduction processes as on Earth. So here's, here's another image of the crater rays just to give you a better idea. So these white streaks of crater rays, they can actually have quite a far reach. Why do you think that we would see rays with young craters but not old ones? All right, yeah. So the old crater rays, they wear away as other impacts destroy them. They're a delicate feature. Um, the moon doesn't have any erosion processes on its surface from wind or water, um, but other craters can act as erosion events for other surface features, right? And this is essentially where all the lunar soil comes from. The reason that it's all um, fine and dusty is because it's been pounded by craters for the last three and a half billion years. All right, so those micrometeors in particular are a really important source of erosion for some of the more fine features on the moon. So you can think of it as those micrometeoroids are essentially sandblasting the lunar surface. <clears throat> 